emodels.co.uk. Make something awesome. Hey everyone, it's Fox from Model Making Guru here. Hello, hello, and welcome to part five of our build of the Meng Warship Builder U Boat Type 7 Silly Fun Build for my very good friends and sponsors, emodels.co.uk, your one stop shop for all your model making needs. In the last episode, we got all the base painting done. Well, I say all, we didn't paint the attack periscopes. You're not painted those yet, they're just primed. There's a very good reason for that. And when I say painted, I don't mean completely painted. We've just done the base color. So we've just done the grays and the deck and things like that. The deck is pretty much done just about. Everything else is just the base colors and some pre or post shading effects just to give it some depth. Now you could happily just leave it here. It looks quite interesting and you know, it's quite a nice little piece to look at. However, we're going to do the next step, which is of course weathering. We want to weather this up and make it look like it's been out at sea for months and months. It's just coming back to, to harbour uh, and that's what we want to show that it's been out on missions. It's just accumulated wear and tear and chipping and plant life and all kinds of nastiness. So that's what we're going to do today. I don't know if we'll get the whole thing and the whole project finished today. We might do in this episode. I don't know. But we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But for the moment, we're going to crack on with the weathering. And the next step, or the first step for this video, is to start with the chipping. I forgot to mention, by the way, we haven't painted the base yet, either. that's the very last step. But the first thing we do today is chipping. We're going to suggest paint chipping, where paint has come off the hull and it's exposed the primer coat underneath. Now, I have done some research because I've built U-boats before, and in reality, there were different colored primers. Some of them were kind of an oxide red, some were kind of light grays or whites. There's all various different colors on there but this is a silly fun build it's a cartoon thing we're not going to go too super realistic so i'm going to go for a light gray color so what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to take the original gray we use the neutral gray which is vallejo 70992 vallejo model color i'm just going to add some white to that i've got some uh, vallejo game color uh, off white which is 72101 i'm just going to add some of that to the gray to lighten it down so it's a lighter uh, color and that's going to suggest where the paint's chipped off and expose the primer underneath so i'll go and get everything ready and we'll that will crack on now before we do any proper painty painty we'll note that i've added the sticker to the tower i've added the laughing sawfish which denotes this as u96 the u-boat you would have seen in dust boat if you've watched that if you haven't watched dust boat go and watch it assuming you you know of the age to watch it U96 was a real U-boat and its sort of symbol was the laughing sawfish. Lots of U-boats had their own little sort of marking on the tower, their own sort of symbol to represent them. Uh, U556 has the sort of devil, the red devil. There's lots of other similar ones. You've probably seen a few of them if you know about your U-boats. But U96 had the laughing sawfish, a kind of iconic uh, mascot. Now it's not 100% accurate, but it's close enough. It's just a silly fun little build. It doesn't really matter. Thankfully, it's a paper sticker, not a, a film sticker. It's, it's not a water slide, it's literally an adhesive sticker. Uh, but because it's paper, there's no clear film around the edge to make it look like absolute pants. So it does stick down nicely. I've squished it down with a cotton bud. It's not exactly brilliant, but it looks fine. And for the sake of this silly build, it's perfect. Now, I did squish it down with a cotton bud. However, and that, that will get it nice and flush to the surface. And it's not too thick, but I do want to make sure that it's protected from anything I'm going to do next. I don't want to accidentally get paints or washes going under the sticker and making it peel off. And you might be wondering why I've done this now and not later on when I've finished all the weathering. Well, it's very simple. Markings like this were painted onto the vehicles, painted on in this case to a U-boat. They're painted on, so when the paint chips away, it takes any markings with it. It would make no sense at all to have a beaten, you know, weathered and rusted vehicle with perfect markings. So if you're making any kind of model and it's got markings on it, whether they're supposed to represent things painted on or vinyl markings or stencil lettering, anything like that, you do it before you're weathering because they would weather just as much as the paint. They weather at the same time. So what I'm going to do to protect those, to make sure I don't get them anything underneath them, I'm going to basically just brush over it with a quick blast of the Vallejo Glaze Medium. Now, if you remember, Vallejo Glaze Medium we've used before is just basically the acrylic paint without any colour in it. It's not a varnish, but you can kind of use it in a similar way as a varnish. I can use it to seal these in. So let me get some on my brush. And I don't need a lot, just a small amount. And all I'm going to do is just brush that over to seal that in. It'll just make a nice little seal over the edge of the sticker. Now I'm doing the whole of this bit of the conning tower, of the sail if you want to call it, not just the bit where the sticker is, 
purely so that it's all even I don't get a step or an edge where there's some glaze and in other areas not glaze if that makes sense Now with that done, we can crack on with the weathering. Now what I'm going to do, let's say this isn't a realistic model, but we are going to adhere to certain basic principles of weathering. Whenever you're doing any kind of weathering, really you want to stick to these as much as you can, just to make sure that even if it's not a realistic build, your brain can look at the weathering and understand that it is weathering and not just a bad paint job, especially with paint chipping, which can very easily go from looking like awesome weathering to it's got measles or you're having a shaky hand day first and foremost with any kind of weathering but especially with chipping try and think why there is chipping there's two main reasons for chipping one a mechanical process something has impacted the paint it's it's scraped it it's dinged into it it's somebody's dragged something along the surface they've walked regularly across the surface there's a physical impact of some sort or physical friction or contact that's removing paint from the metal the second is it's technically it's a mechanical but it's more of a chemical process and that is oxidization i.e rusting uh, the water will rust the metal underneath the paint and that will cause the paint to bubble up lose grip and flake away so in the case of that you want to be looking at areas where water may pool up and collect and sit and do its dirty business on the metal underneath the paint and cause it to bubble. So you want to be looking at areas of high traffic where there's friction and dinging and impacts and also areas where water would pool and collect and start doing its corrosion. Now it is important to note with boats and new boats especially, although it's not absolutely guaranteed 100%, more often than not to be convincing you want to make sure there's no real rust under the water line. Um, above the water line, there's two things you need for rust, water and oxygen. That's why it's called oxidization. You want water and oxygen. Above the water line, of course, when this thing's not submerged, you've got lots of air and you've got the water and any water collecting is going to allow that process to start. Under the water, under the water line, like under here, this is always under the water apart from when it's in dry dock. So really, it's not exposed to air. So the rust, there will be some very slight rust, but it's going to be a very, very, very slow, minimal process underwater because it's got water, just no air. So try and keep your oxidization and rust above the water line and again hence the lack of chipping there'll be less chipping on the underside here because the only real reason for chipping under the water line is impacts and there might be none of those so you might have no chipping at all under the the water line here but you'll have lots of chipping on the top and also keep in mind when these things return to port they could have been out for six months the weathering on these things could be either minimal or it could be ridiculously intense. There could be a ton of chipping. So I've got some reference pictures and stuff I'm going to use. And most of my weathering is going to be above the waterline. But there will be some below, but not much. So anyway, we're going to get some chipping done. So let me get that ready and we'll do that. Now to actually do the weathering, uh, I've got a couple of things. I've got first and foremost my wet palette. Yes, if you don't know what a wet palette is and you haven't seen the previous episodes, I have explained it, I think, in the first or second episode. But if you want to know what a wet palette is, why you should be using one and how easy it is to make... Click up here, there's a link to go and watch how to make one and why you need to use one. You don't have to, but you will find it makes life a lot easier. I've mixed up some of the neutral grey and added in some of that white, that off-white colour, just to make it a nice light grey that's lighter than this grey. And also to do the chipping, I have two brushes. I have my Wargamer Insane Detail, which is very small, and my Wargamer The Psycho, which is stupidly small. It's tiny, tiny bristles. You can't really see in the tube. I don't want to take the tube off. Tiny, tiny. And all we're going to do is we're going to paint the chipping on. Now, the golden rule, another golden rule, is um, chips tend to be quite small. You might get a large area of paint where the paints come off collectively in, as multiple chips, and it's a big patch with no paint. But in reality, paint chips are very small. You would never see a paint chip, for example, bigger than a human hand, a single paint chip. So try and keep in mind when you're doing this, how big is a person, how big is their head, how big is a hand. It's not really viable with this because it's a silly chibi thing it's not realistic and somebody did ask me what scale this was it's it's no real scale it's just silly scale but uh, yeah try and keep in mind how big a person would be if i did a paint chip you know that big it would look a bit stupid because it'd be like the size of an entire person which wouldn't really be how it works so what we're going to do is we are going to get a little bit of paint on the brush tiny bit and it does help to thin the paint a little bit more than normal because you don't want it to be too bold and stark a little bit of paint on the brush and we're just going to start painting in the chipping uh, and like i said before you're going to concentrate around edges where there's contact so especially around things like the bow here the very front the very edge of the pointy bit 
Uh, and what I tend to do is I start just by picking out the edges with my brush at 45 degrees and I'll just jitter my hand a bit like that. You probably can't even see this on camera, but I jitter my hand a little bit. I hold the brush, don't hold the brush tightly like down here. This is for detail painting. Hold the brush further away, say at this end, because that way, if you do have any natural, like you see here, I'm not even, this is just my hand shaking. Any natural jitters in your hand or any natural shaking is amplified. And that just makes the effect even more convincing. Now this is a bit like, you're, at this stage we're just doing edge highlighting. We're just picking out the edges. But what I want to do now, once you've got the edge in, I'll just get this down to here. And apologies if this goes in and out of focus. So once you've got the edge here, what I want to do then is start building up some chips. So what I might start doing is just putting little tiny dots like this where I think paint would chip away. And I'm not going to go massively crazy, but I want to build them up a bit. And try and keep it random. And try, if, if you can, try and keep it centre or focused around edges. Uh, because, you, you know, you might get a dot right in the middle of nowhere, where a little space where paint chips away, but you probably wouldn't. It's more, you get one little chip on an edge, and then that makes another little bit come off, and then another little bit, and you get them stacking up. Uh, and expanding and that's how you end up with big patches of no paint because little chips sort of join together and make big chips so we'll do a few but not many out of the middle of nowhere and you probably can't even see these on camera and they are very very tiny so what i'm going to do is work my way around there's a little stray hair on the end of my brushes so i need to sort that out i'm going to work my way around i'm going to build up the chips and you'll get the idea when I've finished, you'll see, you'll see a bit better what I mean about where to put your paint chips. But keep the paint a little bit thin and just work your way around slowly. Okay, so that's that first round of chipping down. It does look a bit extreme to you on Telebox there. It looks a bit like the, the base colours are a bit darker and the chip colours are a bit lighter, but that's just the way the video makes it look. In reality, it's not quite that contrasty it's a bit more subtle uh, and it's exactly where i want it to be it just looks really nice so that's that first round done and what i've done here is basically suggested that this area is where there are chips the paint's come off it's chipped away and exposed the primer underneath not the primer we use but the primer that exists in the fiction of this vehicle i've decided it had a light gray primer now you might be looking at this tower and thinking that's a bit ott what's that all about here's a photograph of a real u-boat Yes, you can see it did happen that way. So sometimes they went away to see and they did come back horribly chipped. So the next is some more chipping. What I want to do now is as well as have areas where the paint's chipped away and exposed fictitious primer, I want some areas to be paint chipping away because of rust underneath. So I want some of these chips to actually be corroded, have corrosion in them. And that's really simple. For that, we're just going to use the uh, Ammo by MIG Shadow Rust, which is AMIG 043. I love this color, it's really nice. And all we're going to do uh, is we're going to go over some of the uh, chips we've already done. And I'm just going to put the rust colored paint in the middle of the chip. So for example, we'll have a little bit here just in the middle, uh, we'll do, let's find some good areas, we'll have a couple here, little tiny touches, just very subtle. What I'm trying to do is keep the actual outside of the chip, I'll do a bigger one just to make it more obvious for you. We'll do, let's do this one. I'm trying to get paint in the middle of the chip, but keep the outer, oh, I've got no paint on the brush, hello but keep the light gray part of the chip on the outer edge. So what this suggests, if you can see that, I don't know, but what it's trying to suggest, turn it upside down, be easier for me to paint, is a chip has occurred and you can see the light gray color of the primer underneath. But in this case, a chip has occurred and the paint's come off and the primer's come off because of rust underneath the primer, it's bubbled away and what you've now got is a rust, exposed rusty part of the metal hull and then you've got a little sort of bit of primer there exposed and also 
a bit of the paint coming away. I'll do another one here. Don't want too many of them. And it makes more sense to be in places like here where water would pool. But don't worry too much because this is just the first step of doing rust. Okay, so that's the rust chipping done. As you can see, nothing major, just a few bits here and there on the sort of lower surfaces where water would accumulate, like on the tower here, bottom of the vent holes and a few bits and bobs where paint may have chipped off and the metal's been exposed. Maybe that's gone rusty. Again, it's just the first step of the rust work, but it'll do for now. The next step is to try and make all this blend together a bit and give a bit more depth to the whole paint job and just start to make it look a bit more grubby and grimy. Uh, and that is we're gonna do a gunk wash, but we're not gonna use oil paints so let me get everything ready and I'll show you what we're going to use okay now any of you who are familiar with my work may know that when I say a gunk wash uh, I'm usually referring to 502 Abtai Lung Starship Filth oil paint slapping it all over the model Slap it on. rubbing it all off with a cloth or a cotton bud and then leaving it for five days to dry to get a nice dirty grimy effect however this is a small build and a fun build and I don't want to sit around for five days while it waits so I'm going to show you a different method which is still a gunk wash but we're not going to use oil paints we're going to use enamels. We're going to be using uh, two Ammo by MIG products, Engine Grime, a MIG 1407, and a Panel Line Wash Blue Black, a MIG 1617. Both enamel paints are thin to different levels, so they're both compatible with each other. But like I say, when we, normally what we do is we take the oil paint and we slap it all over. Slap it on. We're going to do it with these enamel washes. We're going to do it uh, in a much faster process. So I've got both of these. The trick is to shake them very vigorously. Now, I could just use the engine grime on its own. If this was, say, a, a vehicle that was brown or blue or some other colour, I could just use the engine grime by itself. But as you can see, it's a nice colour, but it's not quite dark enough for, for a, a submarine that's already grey anyway, especially with the dark areas of the German grey. So I'm going to get some of my of this lovely, lovely stuff, which smells fantastic. One thing about enamels is they do smell nice. I'm not going to need a lot, so I'm just going to put about that much in there. Get the rest back in there because it's beautiful stuff and I don't want to waste it. Okay, now this needs to go and sit over there on a piece of tissue. Uh, and put the lid back on. Just do make sure to put the lid back on these things. They evaporate away quite quickly and if you spill them, it's just sadness. Because they, yeah. And then let's get some of the panel line wash, the blue black. Now if you've never used any of these before, the streaking grime is really for grime effects and streaking effects and things like that. And the panel line wash is really for pin washes. Uh, but you can mix and match however you want. So what I'm going to do is add some of this panel line wash to the streaking grime. Not a huge amount. Just put that there. I'm going to rest it on some tissue in case I need to come back to it. Uh, and all I'm going to do is get myself a cocking tail stick, which I failed to prepare. I am useless. Cocking tail stick. Da, 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 da. I'm going to stir these two up. And it should make a nice, slightly darker, grimy colour. Now, if you want to thin these down, you can. You can just use either enamel paint thinners or normal odourless oil paint thinners will be absolutely fine. But you can see there, it's made a nice, dirty, sort of slimy colour. And that's going to probably be about right. And all we're going to do is two steps. The first step, I shall show you now, is quite simply to get yourself a good brush. Not a small brush, but a good brush. And not your favourite brush, because you, know, you don't want to ruin it. And quite simply, all we're going to do is get this all over the model. Everywhere. Don't be shy. Get it on. A bit like when you're doing a, a wash with your black wash. But we're not. We're doing it with this. Now I'm going to go a side at a time. I'm going to do this side first. I'm not going to do the whole model. I might do actually. It won't take that long I suppose. I just don't want the paint to dry out too much between sides. But I might do the whole thing. We'll see what's the worst that can happen. So what this coat will do. And I apologise if this is slightly out of focus. This is going to add a layer of grime and dirt to start with. It's the initial layer of grime and dirt. So you don't want to put it on too thick. You want to be a nice coat, but don't put it on too thick. You've got to get it all off again. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it a side at a time. I'm not going to do everything at once because 
the trick is you don't want this to dry for too long because if it takes too long to dry if you leave it on for too long it becomes impossible to remove or harder to remove so I'm not going to do that so I'm going to do one side I'm going to leave this now to dry apologies if that was off camera I'm going to leave this now to dry for about 20 minutes to half an hour and then we'll come back and I'll show you the next step I'm not doing the side I'm just doing this side for now so about I don't know 20 minutes to half an hour maybe just when it looks dry keep an eye on it and when it looks dry it's not as shiny anymore you need to do the next step so I'll let this dry for a bit and we'll come back okay now this has had about half an hour to to sit and dry a little bit I'm simply taking it back off again with some dry cotton buds I was brave and went ahead and did both sides so I figured I may as well rather than sort of be sitting around on my hands for half an hour two or three times so all I'm doing is rubbing it off very gently I'm not putting any pressure on just taking it off very very slowly I'm doing it with dry cotton buds because I don't want to remove it altogether if I used to if I dampen this with thinners it would just take it all back off again and I'd have a nice clean model I want this to collect in the recesses and add shade but also tint things a little bit just but not too much so I'm just taking this off on the saddle tanks here what I'll do is I'll kind of go this way just to add some streaking because I'm going to be putting streaking here later anyway but this just doesn't do any harm and the bottom of the saddle tanks will just do it the same and we're just going to work our way around like I say you can do this with oil paints I and mean, if you've seen me do this before I do it with oil paints uh, oil paints exactly the same process you slap it all over slap it on but with oil paints you take it off immediately you take it off straight away so you cover it in paint then you rub it off with you know cloth or cotton bud or whatever you're doing uh, the only difference is that oil paints will take up to five days to be fully cured so you be, basically when you do this with oil paints you do this and then you put it in a box away from dust for five days at least if not more uh, and only then after about five days or so when it's had time to dry a bit do you then go in and do anything like varnishes or any other coats of paint over the top the advantage of the enamels <clears throat> and the reason why i've done enamels here is because technically we've only really brushed on a fairly thin coat of the enamel paint and we've taken most of it back off again or we will be so after about 24 hours this will probably be ready for the next load of work should be fine it should have cured enough that i can go ahead and do the next step okay while that was curing i thought i'd crack on with the kriegsmarine flag that goes on the flagpole at the back of the tower the captain's flagpole now i had some leftover cloth flags from when i did the uh, revel 170 second scale u-boat many many years ago and i thought i'd use the 144 scale one i think that's what this is now I'm going to be doing this a very specific way. I've got a very long piece of easy line and what I intend to do is do the captain's flagpole flag and tonnage pennants between the periscopes and the flagpole at the same time. And it's easy to do that with one long piece of easy line. So the first step is going to be to get the easy line into the flag. So around about the middle of the piece of easy line, I'm just putting it in place here. And then what I'll need to do is get some super glue and glue that in place. Now it only takes a couple of small dots, just enough to glue the easy line to that bit of flag. I don't have to cover the whole thing, just a couple of spots, maybe at the top and one in the middle. Once that's had around 30 seconds to a minute or so just to fully cure, I need to now wrap this white part around to hide the thread. Now this is why I left this white bit on here, because this is going to be what hides the thread. So it just needs a small dot of super glue in the corner and we can push that over.
once that's had time to dry of course I need to go ahead and do exactly the same at the other end of the other corner of the flag to lock that in place. Now note for this I'm using the thick super glue. Uh, the thin super glue I had is very very fast curing, very very fast, but it cures before I even have time to put anything together like roll the, the material over so I recommend the thick slower setting super glue for this. Also try not to glue your tweezers to anything or your fingers, that always sucks. Once that's cured, after a minute or two, we need to start thinking about how we're going to make the flag look realistic. We don't want it to be square and solid, that's not how flags work. We want it to look like it's blowing around in the wind, it's all crumpled up. Now there are various ways you can do this, some people like to soak them for a while and then roll them around and scrumple them up. I just like to keep it simple, I like to roll mine around the tip of a paintbrush or a cocktail stick or something, just a few times, just to loosen it up a little bit. Uh, this just gives it a kind of roly roly shape and you can play with it as much as you want but I want to avoid any crisp creases, I want to get some sort of rounded softened finish. So use something tubular ideally, like that brush or something similar, just to start the process. You'll have to work on it for a few minutes just to start softening the fibres and getting it used to being bent around. The final step is to take some PVA glue or Elmer's glue to our colonial cousins, thin down with water uh, and apply this liberally to the whole flag. This just helps to lock the flag in that shape. It's still bendable but it just means it won't eventually straighten out. The PVA will just kind of keep it in that shape. Once it's attached to the model it'll just stay that way forever. I do tend to work it around the edges as well and that just helps to lock in the edges of the fabric. If you have had to trim this at all, you don't want little fibres suddenly fraying and going all sticky out around the edges, so it just helps seal the edges of the fabric in as well. While it's drying, you can still manipulate it and crinkle it around because you'll probably end up getting rid of the nice curviness as you're doing this, so feel free to keep scrumpling it around and making it into different shapes. Give it a couple of coats of this thin PVA and you should be good to go. The enamel paints are still drying, but the flag is now dried and hopefully you can see that's the effect I was going for. It now has the crinkly blowy flag effect. Now it can still be crinkled and crumpled if I man manhandle it wrongly, so I've got to be careful with it. But what I'm going to do now is put it in place. I may as well do it now while I've got the chance, while I'm waiting for the enamels to dry. You can see I've put the periscopes in place now, the attack periscopes. They're glued in place, they're not painted yet, they're still bare primer. But I figure there's no point painting them yet, I've got to do some super glue goodness to get this in place. What I'm going to do, I was trying to figure out how to do this, because I've got to get the flag onto the flagpole. Uh, and in reality the flag isn't attached to the flagpole, it's actually got rope that goes through it and the rope attaches at the top and the bottom. Now I can't quite reproduce that, not at this small scale. But what I am going to do is double things up. I'm going to put the flag on here and the way for me to be able to attach it to the flagpole is to carry it on to the periscopes. Now in reality what would happen is when the U-boat returned to harbour, they'd tie some rope between the, the periscopes and the flagpole and the display banners which show the tonnage of ships they'd sunk. Uh, these little pennants were called tonnage pennants, strangely enough. And they just used to get a bit of rope between the periscopes and the flagpole and they used to stick these pennants on. Now I do have the pennants to stick on there, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the easy line that I put on the flag, you can see it here, uh, to go between the three. Uh, and it just means it also gives me a, a different, slightly better way to attach this as well, so I can do things like... I'll show you when I do it, but I'll, I'll be wrapping this round and gluing it on and it's kind of hard to explain, I'll just do it. So I'm going to be using my fat super glue again to start with. So I'm going to get some on my little, oh, that's my thin super glue, that's the wrong one, he said, squirting it halfway across the thing I've got glue on. Yes. <clears throat> right, so fat super glue. It's the Slow Zap Thick CA. I'm going to get a blob of that on my little mixing pellet. By mixing pellet, I mean the lid to my cotton buds got myself a cocking tail stick now this is going to be hard for me this is hard for me to film because I've got to be able to get my hands around so all you might see is just this right hand all the time but I do apologize but I'll do what I can so what I'm going to do first of all is get some of the fat CA glue the slow setting put a dot there on the back of the flagpole and then if I can very carefully I'm going to put this roughly in place 
and then wrap this round. Oops. Just need to get it there roughly. Let me just move that around a bit. I've used the thick CA because it takes longer to set. Uh, I can do this when there was no glue there, but now I've got glue there, it's incredibly hard. There we go. Hold that there for a second. As I knock the camera with my visor. Well done. I'm pulling it taut because I don't want the flag to be dangling off the flagpole. That should now be glued in place. Yes. What I can do now is let go of the flag with this. Hopefully. So the flag is still loose, but the thread is glued in place. I'll keep saying thread, even though it's not thread. You know it's not thread. It's easy line. The rubber thread that we've used before that attaches with super glue. So what I want to do now, and apologies, this is going to go in and out of focus as I move it around. And I want to do something similar at the bottom end, but not just yet. So what I'm going to do, uh, how can I do this now? I need to get the thread. I need to drop it into where the super glue is. That would be really clever. Well done. Get the thread and we're going to wrap it around the top like this. I'm going to put the glue over here where I can get to it. Get my cocktail stick. A little bit more of the thick CA. It's just going to lock it in place for the moment. I'm going to pull it about halfway so that the thread actually sticks to the back of the pole. Now this is where we get clever because this was supposed to be, unlike the steel cable that was the antenna wire, this is supposed to be just rope or string or whatever the crew would have to hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it around this periscope here. Like this. And then I'm going to wrap it around this periscope as well. Oops. Might glue that in place first, just to secure it. This I use the thin CA glue because it's just a little bit faster setting. It kind of sets almost instantly. We'll wrap it round once more. Now it doesn't matter here. The reason I'm doing this all now is it doesn't matter here with the th with the the fibre going round the flagpole. Normally when you're gluing on Easy Line, you just attach it. You touch it to the whatever you're gluing it to, and it makes contact. You don't wrap it round. But because this is supposed to simulate rope, I can wrap it round. It'll be fine because this is what the sailors would do. The U-boat crew, they would literally wrap the tire rope around the periscope. So if I can get this to go around like that, pull it taut. So therefore me doing it this way by just wrapping it round, technically is not an inaccurate representation. So I can get some more of the thin super glue Touch it on. Some of the thick, actually. Why not? So this is why I didn't paint these periscopes, purely because I knew I'd be dodging super glue on here, and I didn't want to make a mess. Ooh, sweaty and it's nerve-wracking business doing this. So that's that piece on. So I'll need to let that dry fully before I trim it back. Now we have the quandary of the bottom of the flag so what we want to do here is we want to do a very similar thing we want to get the flag at the bottom to go around the flagpole so I need another pair of tweezers I think I need another pair of tweezers uh, we want to go around the back who were around the back misses come on there are you let's Let's do it this way. It's very fiddly. I've already stuck something to my arm. I just felt it fall off my arm. I can come around here like that. So this can now pull taut. 
But what actually I might do is, for the sake of simplicity, I might do put a little bit of super glue on the back of the flag there. And just lock that in place first. There we go. That should hold the flag in place a little bit. Get a little bit of super glue on the back here on the pole. We'll pull that round. We'll pull it round again and again. Apologies, you won't see most of this. We'll pull it round again, lock it in place with some CA glue. Give it a blow. And there we have our flag glued on, close enough, with the thread going out of the top and the bottom of the flag which looks kind of realistic that's the way the rope would really come out and i have to paint that to look like rope got it going across here where i'm going to put some of the tonnage pennants on so i'm going to leave that to dry for a couple of minutes i'll trim the ends off and then we'll do the tonnage pennants back in a moment okay so let's do some tonnage pennants now what i've got here uh, this is part of the decal set from the Ravel 172nd 7C U-boat. Now, it's not, these aren't decals, this is just paper. It's just pieces of paper, and we're going to use these tonnage pennants on our little U-boat. They're not to scale, but it doesn't matter. So it's dead simple. We're just going to, first of all, cut these out. So this won't be very interesting. It's just me literally cutting something out of the piece of paper. It's not really exciting. there it does pay to be neat at this point and what we should have now is our little diamond shaped tonnage pennant uh, roughly cut out now you need to fold it's going to fold kind of folds that way and makes a triangle shape so i'm going to turn it over Dee -dee -dee. i'm going to try and find the middle bit here roughly uh, and then what i'm going to do is just fold that a little bit and fold it properly. Now the chances are you won't have lined it up perfectly. I'm just going to give it a squish with the ruler to flatten it. Oops. Yeah, do it with a bit of the hole. That's really clever. Give it a squish there. Now chances are I won't have lined it up perfectly. So there'll be like an underbite or an overbite. As you can see there, you can see the bit underneath. Well, hopefully you can. Let's see if it's on camera. Uh, this side is not as long. It doesn't go down as far. So what I'm going to do is come back now and tidy that up a little bit. Just so we've got some nice straight edges and no underbite or overbite one bling free that never mind moving on because it's supposed to be just a single piece of material in a triangle shape so if you in reality you're folding it over so if you have an overlap or an underlap it looks a bit weird so i'm just going to trim that now it's fiddly as heck to do this but it's worth it and I bet you can't have seen any of this because it's so far away from the camera. <laughs> there we go. So that's now done. We have a wonderful two-sided pendant. Pendant? No, pennant. So let me move the camera and we'll stick it on the tube, the sub-tube, the U-boat, the new... Uh, words have gone. Fade. Fade. Well, that's the wrong one. It doesn't do that. It does this, doesn't it? Do that. Okay, so let's get that pennant we've just made on. Now you can see I've done one here already. You can see there, that's the idea we're going for. Little pennant that just hangs down on that bit of what would be rope in real life. We've just got the easy line there. We haven't painted that yet. Again, we're gonna paint all this later on. Now this is easy, but fiddlacious. There's lots of fiddlation going on. So what you want to do is you want to get your pennant uh, but you want to get one side of it, the front side or the back side, not both of it. Because we're going to have to try and slot this onto the wire. You want to spread them out a little bit, like that, just so you can, I don't know if you can see that in focus, just so you're not going to get the tweezers on the super glue. Next thing you're going to do is you're going to take some super glue. I recommend the not fast drying super glue. You want to dot a bit on your easy line not a lot just a bit and then all we're going to do is we're going to drop this down on top 
And if we're lucky, we'll do it the wrong way around. Yay! If we're lucky, we'll do it the right way around. And it should go upside down. That's not brilliant. We don't want it upside down, dear. That's not how it works. Special. Right, let's try that again. I'll just replace the super glue just in case. Dot of that, bit of this, drop it down, and we're in. There we go. Just let gravity drop it down the last little bit. Give it a second to stick. There we go. That's on. Now the knot, if you if you're like me, not all of these will line up perfectly. They're not all going to be facing in the same direction. They're going to be one's pointing that way, one point this way as long as they're not upside down but that's fine because it just gives it the same effect as having the crit the flag all crinkly it just gives it a they're moving around in the wind kind of effect hopefully anyway so that's on the super glued not going anywhere what we need to do now is just seal that up together to make a single flag so we're going to get a paintbrush and we've just got some normal pva glue not thinned first of all that's not the right brush hang on we go right so first of all just regular pva not thinned at all i know you can't really see it and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our finger behind it and we're just going to splob some of this on the inside of one side and be generous don't be gentle with it get a bigly amount on there we're going to get ourselves some tweezers now tweezers with a little crook in the end kind of help but doesn't really matter get some tweezers and we're going to clamp those two sides. In fact, we've got some bigger tweezers. We're going to clamp those two sides together. And hopefully, if we look at the lineup, there we go. It's close enough. So that's both sides now clamped together, more or less, not perfectly. We want to seal those in properly, though. So now I've got some more PVA. This is thin with a little bit of water like we did before. And I'm just going to brush this over the whole of the pennant. I'm going to brush it down the edges just to get it to soak in to the inside. And then I'll just brush it down the whole thing. This will just really seal it in place and work its way into the gap. Just to make sure it doesn't open up on you later on. And hopefully it'll seal those little gaps as well. So there we go. It will dry clear. Obviously it's going to dry shiny, but we'll map coat this at the end anyway. So there we go. There's another pen. Now I didn't line that one up perfectly. You can still see a bit of an edge, but it's not the end of the world. So that's adding a pennant. So I'm going to add maybe a couple more of those. It's fiddly work. It takes a little while. I'll add a couple more of those. And then once they've all dried and the PVA is dried, we can perhaps get the painting done for the cable. And there's a little bit of painting on the pennant and the flag we want to do. Not so much painting, but weathering, just to make them look not, you know, spotless. They are the kind of things they only brought out when they went back to port or when they were leaving. The flag when they were leaving and returning and the pennants when they were returning to show off what kills they'd got and what ships they'd sunk while they were out at sea. So they, they would be reasonably clean. They wouldn't be perfectly clean. They've been stuck inside a U-boat for weeks and months, but they'd be reasonably clean. They'd probably keep the flag clean. So we won't do too much on them. But I'll go and get the rest of the pennants done and then we'll see what's next. Back in a moment. And with that done, it's looking pretty good. It's giving me flashbacks to the Queen's Jubilee in 1977 when I was a kid and it was all street parties and fizzy pop and maypoles and bunting and yeah, funny Parker coats because it was the 1970s. I've got loads of photographs. They're all embarrassing. They're all black and white. And I'm like six years old and it's really weird going looking back that far. I was never that young. I was never that young. Oh, anyway, flashbacks. Yes, anyway, that's going to do us for this episode. I was hoping to get more done. Uh, but that took longer than I thought, and we're already at about 45 minutes, so never mind. We'll, we'll start off in the next one with the, you know, the rigging, painting that, getting all the details painted. We've still got to get the deck gun sorted out, bits of dry brushing to do. We've got the last bits of weathering to finish, and we've still got to do the base as well. So we'll crack on with that in the next episode. Thank you so much for watching. Now, of course, as you know, this was filmed for my very good friends and sponsors, emodels.co.uk, your one-stop shop for all your model making needs. If you need to pick up anything, if you want to do this kit and you want to pick some stuff up to do it yourself, everything I've used is stuff they sell. So do pop along to emodels.co.uk. We always say, if you can't find it, you don't need it. If you're looking for something specific and it's not there and you can't find it, it just means it's either out of stock temporarily or maybe it's something they don't sell, but they can get it for you. So if you can't find the thing you're looking for, drop them a line, use the contact form on the website or give them a call and they'll tell you when it's due back in stock or if it's something they can't get, 
they'll tell you if they can get it from one of the distributors because I have seen them get stuff they don't sell for customers so you can always ask if you can't find something just ask but yes as I say we'll carry on with this next time thank you so much for watching take care of yourselves go make something awesome like this go be awesome you there with the eyes on your face looking at my finger doing this Ooh, 3d Ooh. anyway until next time adios amoebas <laughs>